Rex, you were born in Wagga Wagga to a Greek family of cafe owners. That's right. What sort of start in life was that for you? What, what do you remember about the environment you were born in? Oh, well, uh, well I was fortunate. I mean, I remember it as being a very uh, loving, a very caring, nurturing environment. Um, certainly within the, the confines of the family in the cafe, I wasn't so sure about the outside world. Um, it seemed a bit more hostile as I, as I started to understand it a bit better. But, um, but I mean, basically, uh, you know, a, a hard-working family with, with good values, I guess. Um, and so, just me, myself, and an older brother, and, and uh, we had everything that we could have asked for. Um, I suspect the fact that Mum had three, three sisters, you know, so we had three aunties on tap as well. Uh, I guess that helped a, a fair bit. But um, what yeah, was we, the relationship uh, that you had with your father when you were young? You know, sort of five, six, seven. Oh well, I I, uh, I adored him. I um, uh, I idolised him. I, I guess as uh, as I would imagine many young young boys do their father. I mean. You know, subsequent events didn't turn out so well, and and uh, in what way? Oh well, it, uh, my my folks were divorced when I was quite young, um, mainly because Dad was a gambler, um, <laughs> uh, a chronic gambler, mm. uh, and it and it's a disease that is in his family and therefore in my family as well, um, and so that that made it very hard. But I think I, at that at that age, I think I so I was about. Uh, ten or eleven or so when they when they split up, but even prior to that, I'd I'd sensed there was a great deal of stress on on the marriage anyway. In so far as my mum was the oldest of four daughters, and and her father had come from Greece as well, although mum was born here, so her father had come from Greece, and he was and my grandfather was a, you know once again a very wonderful man, and a, uh, you know a dominant figure within within my early life and. Um, and I, I think intuitively I understood that that was a very awkward dynamic, uh, that my mum was caught between a husband and a father, and the husband and father, you know, so my father and my grandfather didn't ever get on really that well. So I think that put a lot of pressure on Dad. But I mean, just in terms of my relationship with him, uh, you know, I always loved him immensely. And, and even, even after they'd uh, split up, my brother took it a lot, I think took it a lot worse than than I did. Um, he, I, he, I think he had a lot of trouble uh, subsequently forgiving Dad over many years. Whereas, whereas uh, you know, once the family we'd moved to Sydney and stuff, I used to keep seeing Dad, see him all the time, and go to the footy with him. And um, you know, occasionally he'd give me five or ten dollars, and occasionally <laughs> I'd give him five or ten dollars. <laughs> um, uh, and certainly, once you know, once kids came along, or my kids came along. Uh, Dad was a f uh, fantastic babysitter, and um, and my kids absolutely adored him. So it 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 wasn't that complex a relationship. I, I don't think. I think it was pretty simple all the way through. Do you remember anything specific that you uh, that you remember about him that that was kind of a, a lesson for you that you took as a lesson, or that you took as something meaningful to carry with you? Uh, several things, I think. I mean. Uh, I think, in one respect, the way that he, um, I, I thought the way that he tried to ingratiate himself to people who were fairly racist towards him, I think I didn't like that. I, I felt that that was the wrong thing. I, I, I didn't respect him for trying to ingratiate himself. Um, uh, I think the fact that his his lack of responsibility, you know, without knowing how bad that disease can be, uh, I think I lost respect for him over that as well. Um, uh, so that'd be the main, uh, I guess, the main, the main things that I would have um, I would have noticed. But I, but I would have outweighed those because I, I mean, his his love of us kids and his love of life were things that were really positive things that I took from him. So the way he behaved towards you and towards your oh, mother was wonderful. were things that you regarded as, as examples? Absolutely, yeah. I mean I, 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 mean, I think in his, own, in his own fashion he really loved uh, Mum. Uh, it's just I don't think he knew. Uh, he'd, he'd come from a very poor, uneducated, rural 
background in Greece during you know during tough times and uh, I mean he'd be, he'd get on with his mother and he was sent out to Australia because his mum had a couple of brothers out here and I think the the theory was that they were gonna <laughs> they were gonna smarten him up a bit because I think his dad was a uh, was a gambler and you know and not uh, not not a hard worker um, so I think the idea was that dad would get sent out here and the uncles would toughen him up and smarten him up and he'd go back to Greece a changed man. Um, but, uh, but the war intervened and so he didn't go back to Greece. Uh, so so he, he stayed out here. So I don't think he had much idea of what it meant to be a, a husband and a father. Any, you know, and I, I mean, I say that because I, I don't think I, I had much idea myself. Um, and it's something I, I guess it's hard to learn. Um, you were saying you felt the outside world a little bit hostile at mm. times. Um, this is a period of time uh, in Australia, especially rural Australia, I suspect, where um, European migrants were fairly common. But the attitudes, what? Tell us about. Well, it was the era of the. Of, it was very heavy assimilationist era. The white Australia policy was still very much in place. Um, we were. Uh, I mean, I knew the way that they that. We had a cafe, and I just knew the way that the customers called us dagos and stuff like that. I mean, I knew that that was not what you know that wasn't a good thing to be. I can tell it wasn't wasn't a compliment. Um, and and those references, I, I mean, they cut deep as a as a kid. And 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 uh, I mean, I suppose that sense of otherness of being outside of the of what was regarded as the real Australia um, was that was a very strong sense in in those days so uh, there was always very much a a feeling that we needed to strive really hard to be as australian as we could and and you know and and eschew being greek or anything that was not english in that did, sense. did you feel alienated at mm, all very much so absolutely um it's the, probably the dominant feeling i i remember as, as a, a kid um i was much happier in um in a, a fancy world of of radio and comics and movies and stuff like that. Was I, that an escape? Absolutely. Mm. I mean, the only thing, the only place where I, I, I felt at all comfortable was in sport. Uh, it seemed to me, and not that I would have been able to articulate it at the time, but it seemed to me that that was genuinely democratic. I guess because it had, you know, an objective measurement to it. You could either, you know, either you could run fast or you couldn't. You could either catch the ball or you couldn't. You could either hit it or kick it or whatever. And you could be valued on your ability to do that. So what, what did you do? What sport did I you I played all, pretty well all codes of football. Uh, one of the great things about Wagga Wagga is the, where it is, uh, where it's situated, means you get all football codes are, are influenced there. So, you know, we played rugby during winter, so it would be rugby league maybe at school during the week and Aussie rules on the weekend and maybe... Uh, soccer on Sunday and occasional game of rugby union and stuff. So, so that means summer a lot of cricket, cricket and swimming. So, how did that impact on your socialising at that age? Given the fact that you've got this yeah. Greek family in this hostile world, and the sport in the middle. Well, Dad loved sport, so I mean, he was he, he encouraged it incredibly. So, you know, he he absolutely loved the football, all codes, and uh, he played a bit himself. Um, so uh, it, it was the one area where I thought socially I, f I felt comfortable, you know, I could... Uh, were you able to make friends through yeah, that? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there were other Greek kids playing who were... Who Not were, Australians? Yeah, yeah. Oh, about the bulk of them were Australians. Yeah. But I mean, the fact that there were other Greek kids made it feel not quite so uh, alienating. But, but um, generally, you know, in, in, in a sporting context, yeah, I felt pretty well at home. At what point did that change, do you think? At what point did you start feeling different, or differently, I should say? Oh, well, I, I mean, I felt different from the moment we went to school. I mean, I was aware that we were Greek and most of the rest of the, the, rest of the school <laughs> wasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, in those simple, sort of fairly, what now seem like cliche terms of just things like, simple things like lunch and stuff, you know, just having different food, was it... You know, I loved the food we ate, but I was embarrassed that it was so totally different to what... I mean, I wanted soggy tomato sandwiches like the other kids. 
I, you know, I didn't necessarily want leftover moussaka. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was curious as to how long it took, what was the process and what were the milestones in you overcoming that? What was the process of you growing through that and, and, and Australia growing through that? Uh, well, arguable as to whether it has, but right. uh, that's a separate issue, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I think there are a lot of things happened around around about puberty. A lot of things happened for me. One was that, that dad and mum by then were divorced. My grandfather, the alpha male, uh, died. We Mum's sisters had married and moved away. So we moved from Wagga Wagga to Sydney. So that, uh, and to a very Anglo, very Anglo school, a school that prided itself on, on being Anglo. Um, and so that was, that was very alienating, but at the same time, uh, I think that was when I started to realise that as an individual I needed to control, once again, I probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it, but I needed to control what I wanted to do. I, I needed to stop, I think, worrying so much about what other people thought, that there was, you know, intimidating as it was being in a big city, I nevertheless felt that I could go by myself to the football, I could watch TV, I could go by myself to the movies, and I could get on. I, I could get around and I could get on. And, and really for me, that and so while that was a sort of um, pattern of treading water a little bit, and I didn't do academically very well, um, and I tended to mix with the, the troublemakers at, at school, but the moment I got to university, that's when it changed for me because university was suddenly full of wogs. It was a time when education was, was free, or tertiary education, because I wouldn't have, my, my pass wasn't good enough to get a scholarship, so, uh, and mum couldn't afford to, to uh, send me, or she could barely just afford to, to send me. But I got there and was able in the second year to get a scholarship, but once I got there, I knew that's where I belonged. I, I, I just, it changed overnight, just to see other kids eating yogurt and just things like that, things that were just so foreign elsewhere. Mm. Um, but there are other kids who went to the movies who were also, you know, um, misfits and, and, you know, and suddenly if you get a lot of misfits together, then you've got a community. Um, and so that sense of community was very strong. Uh, and uh, I mean, that was bolstered also, I, I guess, by the fact that the university I went to, which was uh, University of New South Wales, was in Kensington, so there was a very strong um, Greek community around the university anyway. So it was sort of good, like, you know, I could, I could go down the street and there were Greek families there, not, you know, and with, they pretty quickly recognised other Greeks and, you know, they would sort of look after me. And Dad lived around there too a bit, so I could see him. And uh, it just meant that there was, I just felt secure that there was, that they were watching over me in a sense. Um, so it meant I couldn't, you know, I couldn't go to the pub and get too drunk or couldn't muck up and stuff like that because, They'd also report that back. But I mean, certainly university for me was the... the t I, I, I went there very young. I'd, I'd only just turned 17 at, because I was the last year of the five-year leaving certificate um, and went straight from school to university. And it just made all the difference. And the fact that there was a drama department there. Which you were drawn to. I'll yeah. come to that in a second, but I'm mm. curious about your relationship with uh, your brother, your older brother, um, and in, with, with friendships with men in general that you were developing now at this stage, mm. um, how did you select uh, your groups, uh, your, your social friends? Um, my brother is three and a half years older than me and we, we didn't ever really connect all, all that much. Um, he was much more scientifically... Well, it's curious. I mean, he ended up... Uh, because he had all that pressure of a migrant family to become a doctor, he did become a doctor. Um, and he was very good at, at those subjects that he needed in order to become a doctor. But at the same time, he was also a very good piano player and a very, very good artist and illustrator. And it always seems ironic in retrospect that he's the one who, who followed the science and, and not the, the arts. Um, and so he was, uh, it was an age 
gap that was significant. And uh, and when we moved to Sydney, he moved. He went and lived in college at, at uh, Sydney University. So he didn't. He was not living in the same place. He was at a different uh, different university and all of that. So um, uh, we didn't we didn't have that much in common. And and particularly, I I, I I suspect when he when I was starting to get a bit arty. I mean, I think he felt. Um, he, he seemed to feel obliged to be a little bit mm, not so sure about that. But in terms of how I did uh, find friends at school, it was it was uh, there were a couple of kids at school. One was um, Martin Johnston, the son of George and Charmaine Clift, uh, and Martin had just come returned from that family had just returned from Greece, so he was clearly an outsider as well, but there was, he, could, he spoke much better Greek than I did, um, uh, and I really admired him. And there was another guy, Michael Long, who was uh, very, uh, very histrionic, very theatrical, and who subsequently went on to NIDA. Uh, and, and they were the sort of kids uh, that I gravitated towards, and I did play a bit of football and, and cricket there, and. Um, and so found some friends within that, but they generally tended to be the kids who were a bit rebellious. What about than... women, girls? Oh Meeting well, I, I, I was so hopeless at it. Uh, I mean, I was infatuated with them, but I, I had no opportunity. I mean, I just didn't know how to talk to them. Or... You had no skills in that regard. None whatsoever, because, and I really regret that. One of the things I really found difficult in adjusting to Sydney was that I'd come from a co-ed school to an all-boys school and I just thought the all-boys boys school was just stupid. It just seemed such a ridiculous idea and although I had female cousins and stuff like that, uh, it's just I, I just wasn't any good at, at talking to girls or I just didn't know how to. So the, I'm interested to hear about the, the, the sort of social pressures um, that were exerted on you in terms of who you might date and ultimately oh, well. marry <laughs> and friends you might keep. <laughs> well, although he didn't have as much influence as he, he, he thought he should have, my father was very adamant that it should be Greek, you know, that it should be a Greek girl. I mean, that was, he was very strong on that. Um, that didn't come to pass, but nevertheless, he was strong on that. Uh, I mean, I think the rest of the family, they were, they were concerned that um, they were pretty conservative and uh, they were very, I mean they were happy that I was getting educated, that was important um, and it should be somebody who was equally well educated um, and it should be somebody who, uh, uh, and, and, and male friends should be guys with good prospects, you know, who were going to be doctors or lawyers or, you know, professional in some way that um, not that there was anything wrong with being a tradesperson, but it was felt that we should be aspiring to a notion of something higher, and that that uh, that, that should be the, um, the fairly conventional uh, progress through through meeting a nice girl, getting married, having kids, having a nice house, and making everything nice. Nice. Uh, what was your view about all of that? Did you take any notice? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um, I mean, I understood, I, I could understand why they felt like that, and, and mum in particular. And, and, you know, God bless her, she's 91 or whatever, and she still feels like that, I think. I still think she thinks I'm going to get a real job. Um, it's not too late to become a doctor, uh, you know, but it is. Um, uh, no, I, I didn't ever feel, uh, I, I mean, it was such a, I was, I was so aware of the fact the world was changing, that, that all sorts of things were changing, that culturally there was a huge change. I'd always, I mean, from the moment I was a kid, I'd, from the moment I'd heard I'd loved rock and roll, I loved what Elvis did, and more importantly, I loved what he stood for. I loved the fact that the Beatles were, slight, were rebellious, that they had long hair. I loved the fact that Bob Dylan was Bob Dylan. Um, I, I certainly at that time of university, I loved the fact that uh, the drugs were freely, pretty readily available. I loved the fact that girls were on the pill and that sex was pretty readily available. So all of those things suited me, um, and they didn't necessarily conform with what I think the family would have thought was the way to go. 
in those uh, wonderful years of irresponsibility, um, are there things that you regret now? Um, I guess the things I, I, I regret are, I think, the times when I can remember being mean to somebody um, or, or using, using sarcasm or something to put somebody down. Um, they're the things that I, I regret now and, uh, and, and that I hopefully have eradicated. But I mean, they're the things, it's been mean to people on the instances where I were, they're the things that I would take back. But I don't think there's any, in terms of lifestyle decisions or anything like that, I don't think there's anything, uh, I don't think I regret any of that. You've had a fabulous career in the arts um, and you still have it. And I just wonder though, there would have been times that were challenging, difficult. Well, it's all yes, there, yes, there have been, and uh, both in professional and personal. Oh, uh, in both areas, yes. Uh, but I've been very fortunate. Um, um, I, I think I understood early on that I probably wasn't. Um, I wasn't talented enough in any one area in order to be able to make that a, a career, and and and. Partly that, and I guess partly rationalising it. I was interested in a lot of other things, anyway. So I didn't ever want to be just an actor. I wanted to do other things. I wanted to direct, and I wanted to write. And I didn't ever want to just work in theatre. I wanted to work in radio, and I wanted to work in television. I wanted to work in film. So, so f touch wood. Fortunately, they've always uh, there's always been a, a job prospect on the horizon, and I've been able to get by. Uh, I, th I think being mediocre at a lot of things is, is better than being mediocre at just one thing. Um, and so I think that's, that's been something that I, that I made sure. I always want to make sure I was employable. That's the main thing. Uh, and that's what I strove to be. On the personal front, mm. um, how have you found the, the, the changed social environment and your sense of success, which I presume you, you, you have, how did that impact on the way that you form friendships and relationships? Well, uh, um, I think most of the most of the friends that I've retained over the years have been people who um, who I've known since earlier days. Anyway, so we we sort of know one another's secrets pretty well, and I think that's that's not the only reason we've been remained friends but I mean that certainly we knew each other before those sort of protective shells had formed but I, I mean I'm also fortunate to have uh, a fantastic family who and my wife had come as been, had been an actress and stuff so she understood the business uh, but uh, you know she has very she comes from a very strong family and very strong Christian values and and uh, and and the kids are, are Great. So I mean, there's never been. They wouldn't tolerate any sort of bullshit. You know, the, that was never a possibility. So I mean, at home, it's it's home. I'm just expected to do carry the load. You know, that I shouldn't be carrying. How do you solve conflict within that relationship with your wife? Where, where it's well, I think we've both gotten better over the years at being able to take a breath and step backwards and, and take a few steps back and just try to calm down and, and sort through rationally. And, and, and I think we've been better at expressing or articulating what's upset us in the first place. So I think we've gotten better at that. And I think, you know, the fact that we really resolved that we didn't ever really want to go to, go to sleep with anger, um, I think was, uh, has been a, a big factor. But, but she's pretty feisty. And if I'm being a dickhead, she sort of lets me know that pretty quick. Um, are you are you fiery tempered? Do you well, I in, I have been in the past. I'm less, much less so now. And I think I think now you know the really important thing that that works for me is that is that I'm very conscious that that I've uh, you know I've I've had the bulk of my life. I'm uh, you know not that I you know I hope to be around for a while longer, but I just I want it to be really. My, ret my remaining time, I want to be really good quality, and I just don't have any place for negative 
uh, emotions and attitudes and stuff like that. So I just get rid of those. How? Now. Oh, I, I just concentrate on more positive things and, and I just let... I mean, the other, the most important thing I ever learned was from my agent who, who really convinced me and made me understand that it was pointless worrying about things I couldn't control. And I used to spend a lot of time doing that. And once that really dawned on me, and um, once I understood what that meant, it's become so much simpler. Life has become so much simpler. And I guess that's what I've been trying to do in over the last decade or so, is just keep my life simple. Now, I just keep it in, in things that work well, that I know from experience that work well. And, and I, I just don't have time. I just can't let... If someone wants to have an argument or something like that, I just walk away. I, I'm not... I mean, I'm prepared to have an intellectual argument and stuff like that, but I'm, I couldn't, I wouldn't get involved in anything that's, I just, negative stuff just doesn't, I don't have time for it. What do you regard as the biggest challenge that you've faced uh, in life? I don't mean, you know, f <laughs> fixing a flat tyre kind yeah. of challenge. Well, I mean, it sounds a bit wanky, I suppose, but I, I, I mean, I've always hoped to improve, to get get better as a as a as a person and all you know to be a better father to be a better husband to be a better friend um and those sort of things i think i've always tried to i look to try and improve that so if I, I i get disappointed if i let myself down if i feel as though i've entered a situation and that situation has not improved because of my intervention then i really disappoint myself so whatever the situation is, I would like to think that I can, that any contribution I have is going to improve it. You were saying about your father's, uh, your family's gambling addiction history, uh, which would have touched you. Now, what are some of the downsides and upsides, and how did you control the potential for the downsides? Oh, uh, well, the downsides are that you can lose, uh, you know, you can lose your whole marriage you can lose all of your property, you can lose all of your money, you can lose all of your respect. So they're big downsides. Um, uh, and I didn't want to do any, have any of those downsides. So, uh, so for me it was a matter of, I, I was able to, uh, I mean I learned, because I learned from an early age how to read a, a deck of cards, what, no matter what the game was that we were playing, you know, I understood what the percentages were, if it was poker, I knew what the likelihood was going to be that the next card would be whatever, whatever you know, what I needed in my hand, I, I could calculate odds and stuff, so I knew all of that. And that was good, I was able to use that at university, I, I, I used that to supplement my income. Uh, there were, you know, there were a lot of students who were reckless gamblers, and I would just observe them. Uh, you know, use, I'd usually watch them for a couple of games before I sat in, I just wanted to see how they bet, what sort of patterns, what sort of hands they bet on, stuff like that, so I could try and read what they were doing, and I'd get in, I'd, and I was, I'd never took, tried to, I never took too much money. I always made enough and got out and lost a couple of hands and then left so that I wasn't, you know, it didn't look too suspicious uh, and used that to supplement my income. But then once that was over, I, you know, and then I'd later, after that I'd gotten into a couple of games and, and it's just the awful thing is you just keep going. It's compulsive. So for me it was just a matter of cold turkey. I, could, I just had to stop. And the real downside is I can't have a... There's no such thing as a fun game of cards, you know. Even with, even with playing snap with the kids or something like that, you know. Um, you know, I mean, Dad was gambling up until the day he died. You know, it was hopeless. Okay, you say cold turkey. Mm. So that's sheer willpower. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yes. There's no other way. Well, no. Well, no one else is going to do it. You know, so. If I don't do it, then I'm not going to stop. So that's the only way I can stop. But, uh, you know, I would love to be able to sit down and have a, a fun game of 500 or something. And it's impossible. <laughs> it's just impossible. I just think, why well, are you counting the trumps? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> he just played that. You can't, you know, so. You mentioned that you came from a quite uh, religious family. Mm. And your wife is, I think you mentioned, uh, a, a Christian. What is your relationship with Christianity or spirituality or religion? Well, with, with religion, not much. Um, uh, other than... Uh, other than, I mean, uh, uh, what I guess are the Christian values as articulated through the Ten Commandments, uh, I don't find them as being that much different from other religions and other values. and. And so I think 
think uh, I think they're probably values that I've, uh, I try and live by, but I don't have that. For me, that doesn't have anything to do with the church or with any specific religion. It's a it's a set of moral and ethical values that I try and observe. Um, I uh, I think it was I think it was Ernest Hemingway who said, "I have faith in faith," and I think that's what's important uh, to to formulate a set of values, a moral code, and to try and adhere to that. Um, that's what I've tried to do and that's what's important for me. The, the, religi the religious part of it is not important to me, but the spiritual part is. One of the things uh, Christian faith teaches is forgiveness. Mm. Do you find it easy to forgive people? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I... I guess uh, I mean, I'm more and more aware of how flawed I am as a human being and I see that in, and I can recognise that in other people as well and I, uh, I tend to think we're all works in progress um, so um, we're all prone to make mistakes and, and I sort of, um, I sort of feel, and I suppose partly because of the work that I do, that, that you have to go out there and, and take risks and and do things, and sometimes that means you do misjudge or make errors or mistakes, and and that uh, th that's a normal part of being human, and uh, and uh, yeah, I feel that strongly. The flip flip side of that really is guilt. You were saying before you alluded to this that mm -hmm. you you try and deal with things uh, in a positive sort of way. How do you deal with feelings of guilt? A shame. Oh, I, I, uh, I try not to dwell on it. To, I mean, I try not to let it obsess me uh, and get depressed about it because I've been through a depression and I know what that was like, and I don't, I wouldn't want to go back to that. So I try and, I try and think, what have I learned from this, and how can I make sure I don't do that again? How did you get in, and how did you get out of that period of depression? Well, I, I got into it because um, a, a number of factors um, collided. Uh, my mum was moving to Queensland. Um, my eldest son was going away to England for a, a year or so. Um, and I, there was a work situation that wasn't that wasn't good, and at the same time. Um, I had a thyroid condition which, which had, been, had gone undiagnosed for some time, so I was subject to very bad mood swings. And, and I just found that, uh, you know, I couldn't watch the TV news without being weeping. Um, I just, my nerves, I was sharp, I was, I was you know, jangly and, and harsh on the kids and stuff like that. So, so I knew that wasn't good, and, and, and through that period, I, I really focused on the work. I just had to focus on what I was doing in terms of work and try and exclude all of those other um, intrusive feelings. So it was when I had time to think, which when I would get really depressed. So I tried to make sure I loaded myself up with no thinking time. Uh, and then I, I managed to get some treatment for it. I managed to finally someone diagnosed that there was something wrong with my thyroid, and they and you know there was a chemical in the brain that wasn't uh, happening quite so well at the time. So a combination of treatments for the physical ailments and, um, and, and I guess just a very sympathetic family was uh, what got me through. And, and what about personal effort in that? I mean, you must have had a will to beat it. Oh, absolutely. It. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, was, oh, I think the major thing was to, to understand that it wasn't... Uh, um, that there wasn't anything wrong about it, you know. It didn't make me a bad person because I was depressed. Mm -hmm. um, that that I, that it was a not uncommon um, um, feature of people's lives, and uh, and so I just need. And, and I knew I had to do something constructive to get out of it because I, I knew I didn't want to keep going down. How long um, did that last? Uh, I suppose a year or so. I suppose almost a year. Um, and I just, I just knew it would get better. I just knew things would get better. And particularly once I started getting treated, I knew that they would get better. But even before that, I mean, I was, 
I resolved to try and stay positive about work and not and just use my will to not allow those negative thoughts to impeach. One of the things that I'm interested about is people that you've admired, um, either for professional reasons or personal reason, mm -hmm. reasons, you know, mentors or, or, or mm -hmm. figures to whom you look up. Do you have any of those? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, so, uh, certainly professionally and, and personally, there's a, a couple of people in the business that, that I'm in that are uh, slightly older than I am, and I think that in, in both cases they were... Um, I mean, I think they both instilled in me the that that working hard was its own reward, um, and that and that by working hard it, you could also have a lot of fun. So that those things weren't mutually exclusive. And in fact, the harder you worked, the more fun you could have. And I always wanted to be in a job where I could have fun. You, you know, where I could do that. And so I think um, I, th I I think. Very early on, I learned from them the value of of the gift of being able to work at a job that you enjoy doing, you know, and 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 understand that the majority of the world doesn't have that opportunity. That's a great privilege to be able to do something you enjoy doing, and that needed to be respected. Would people know who they are? Uh, one is Ted Robinson, who's a, a, a television. Producer, I, I guess he's best described as, and the other is Bruce Miles, an actor and a director, and uh, and both of them, uh, a very strong influence on me in that sense. But also, uh, even before that, at, at university, I mean, the Philip Parsons, one of my lecturers at university, was um, wonderful man. He uh, he really also instilled in me the uh, I think the um, the strong sense about about a work ethic. But that goes back. I mean, my my grandfather was a you know he was very strong about about the need to work hard and the need to respect your work, and that through that you could do good things. Well, speaking about the work, let's speak about your role in the slap. Mm. Tell us about the character, what you like about it, and what it tells us about Australian society and Australian men. Well, the character was Manolis, the old. Man in the uh, of the family, who's uh, the uncle of the the slapper, the the, the man that Harry who slaps the kid, uh, and he's spent his life trying to keep his family together, and he finds this one incident is this seemingly insignificant minor incident has the potential to unravel his whole. Family, and so I think it's through through that awareness of how fragile the things that we love can be, and how easily they can be dismantled. Um, what sort of a man is he? Uh, a fairly conventional, a man who's like most migrants has had to give up a lot uh, in order to come to a new country and struggle to make a life in a new country and that's always predicated on making it better for his children and his children um, for whatever reasons don't seem to have really um, capitalized on that his, you know his daughter is divorced and with a couple of kids his his son's life, marriage is also precarious and he can see his son treating the grand his grandson or his, so his son treats his own son, and he can see that is poor. And he also the relationship between Harry and his dead father was also a poor relationship. And I think he's very conscious of that, of there being a generational um, legacy that needs to be broken at some point. At some point, somewhere along this chain, someone has to say, we've got to stop behaving like that. And and he feels that maybe he should have done that earlier. Uh, so he's a man who's who's taking stock of his life at that point. He's questioning his religion very strongly. Um, what he doesn't understand why, if there is a God, why that God would allow things to happen that do happen. Um, so he's very strongly questioning that. He's also a person who's at the end of his working life. He's retired, so. 
many men, most, a lot of men, a lot of people, define themselves through their work. And once they don't have a work anymore, there's a sense that they've lost their worth, that they're, they're no longer of, of any value. So I think he's questioning that as well, and he's having to stock take on his life at that point. How did you feel about portraying this character, and why, why did you accept the role? Oh, well, I'd loved the book. I mean, I love uh, Christos's writing. I think uh, I, I like the fact his writing is very bold and very aggressive, and yet he himself is a very gentle and very... And, and I know the thing that hurt him most was that people thought... Some people, a few people, thought it was immoral or amoral. And he's a highly moral man, and I, and I think... And I, I think the, the moral values in the book that he questions are worth questioning, and how did we become who we've become, what have we let, what values have we let slip in order for our lives to be as they are. So um, so I, once I knew they were doing it, I really wanted to do it. I was worried that maybe I was a little bit too young for the character of Manolis that I ended up playing, and I knew I was too old for the younger guys in it. So I thought it would just pass me by, but um, but by a you know, series of good luck, I, I managed to get into it and, and, um, and was very, uh, apprehensive about it um, because it was such a uh, such a formidable cast. Um, the other actors I, were actors I really admired, and I thought, you know, they really had their chops, and they'd been doing a lot of work and good work. And so, uh, but at the same time, it was a, uh, it was something I felt very passionate about it. And once again, mainly because of my own dad, my my grandfather, it was a, it was a, a meeting Christos's father. It was that generation of men who, who'd come to Australia and I wanted to be able to tell their story with, with a certain degree of respect and, and without them being stereotyped and, and made two-dimensional in the way that those characters so often are. And so I thought it was an opportunity to, to be able to represent them. Finally, I'd like to ask you, at this point, you've had a lot of life experience. Uh, and I just wonder, and you've had a lot of opportunities to analyse it, like for example playing that character gives you an opportunity to kind of analyse yourself at the same time. I just wonder whether you have uh, articulated to yourself a, a set of values about life, your, your, the things that are important to you, your philosophies if you like, and if you have, whether they have changed over time. I'm, I'm not sure whether they would have changed that much. I mean, I think I've probably become uh, a bit more stronger in believing them, and and I think then I can now sort of uh, crystallise them into basing it on respect for other people. Um, I think that's the thing that I've really learned the most. That if I want to be treated with respect, then then I need to treat other people with respect. Um, and that's and that human beings are fallible. That no one tries to be. Or I don't think people try to be bad. I think people generally try to be good, and sometimes they can't quite attain that. And, and circumstances may not allow them to be as good as they want to be. But but I I base it on how I would like to be treated. Um, and so, however I would like to be treated, that's how I would want to treat somebody else. Are you able to consciously pass that kind of uh, philosophy on to your children? Well, I've certainly tried to, and I, I and and I and I think they are all. I'm really proud of them. They're all. There's four of them, and they're all. Um, you know, they're all educated, and they're all employed, and you know, they're on the way to being. A couple of my parents already, and and um, very proud of them. Yeah, I mean, I think they've, they've, uh, I think they've also been smart enough to see where my faults have been, and I think they've probably learned from that about uh, how they'll treat their kids better. I guess. Thank you very much. Pleasure.